What's up, everybody? This is Dominic D'Angelo. I'm of several outlets, scscoops.com, adfreeshows.com, and I am here today. It is episode two. It is right down the middle with Bill Fonzi Alfonso. Fonzi, how are you, man? Hey, Daddy. I am great. I'm living in Tampa Bay, living the dream, Daddy. <laughs> Looking good. It's good. We had a fun first episode where we just covered a general basic overview of what the show is going to be about. And I thought what a better way to start, what better way to start uh, than cover the guy that we're, we're on, the channel we're on. We're live on rvdtv.com. So be sure, if you're on there, be sure to like, subscribe, get the word out about Fonzie, get the word out about this show, and uh, we can get some more. And guys, feel free to put some questions in. Uh, if you use the super chat, that helps out the show a lot. But you can also just pop in and get a comment in uh, on the on YouTube, uh, on Twitter. We're on RVD's Twitter today, and we're also uh, yeah on RVDTVLive.com and on my screen. Thanks, Thanks RVD, Daddy. Yep, yep. So guys, yes, be sure to share out and shout out. But today, I think a good way to start is to cover Rob Van Dam himself, and uh, what a relationship you guys have had. You guys are synonymous with one another. Um, I want to first give credit to Robert D. Felice, who ha happened to do, write the research and do the research on it. He did a great job. I looked over the notes and uh, very impressive work. So, uh, Fozzie, let's – well, before we do anything, uh, do you have anything that you want to say in regards to just being back here and uh, what your your excitement for the show moving forward? Well, I'm super excited. I mean, uh, a lot of people are doing podcasts. Now I'm doing one. So I'm really excited about it. We're getting uh, – I'm getting all kind of uh, comments on my social media, Fonzie. We watched the first one, and it wasn't live, but uh, I really, I'm really enjoying it. I got, we got so much to cover. Not only ECW and RVD and Sabu, and uh, but I go back to uh, 1978. Holy uh, smokes! With uh, Terry Funk, and that's why Sabu and I get along so good. Um, this is a retirement. Ben Dam was on this show. This was Ben Dam's retirement, uh, Terry Funk's retirement deal in Texas on his ranch. So, man, we're gonna have a lot to talk about. Lots to talk about. So, so yeah, B BBC just contacted me today and they want to do an interview. I mean, they want to talk about Giant Gonzalez. Yeah, I was, man. I assistant for three years for him and we traveled the world and man, we. We were on movies and uh, Baywatch and Hogan's Thunder in Paradise and all kind of Mike does uh, all kind of shows and uh, really cool. So we got a ton of stuff to talk about and oh. during the podcast, the wrestling fans are really going to enjoy it because we're going to be talking about wrestling. Absolutely, absolutely. Some other stuff too. Oh yeah, no doubt about it. We're going to cover so much ground on here, and uh, we got almost we got over two hundred people tuning in right now. So guys. Be sure to chat, shout us out, spread the word, share it out. Uh, if you're watching on Twitter, go to rvdtv.com. You can pop a question in. Use the hashtag AskFonzie, too, and that, that'll help us out as well. But, uh, Fonzie, let's get to it. Uh, yeah, I love questions. I love questions from the fans, from uh, the wrestling people. Yeah. Oh, you who, know, who love the business just as much as we do. Right. They? Exactly. That's the thing too, is like, that's the neat thing about kind of going live on these things is we can get live fan interaction and people that are passionate about it and uh, want to get the word out too about, you know, what we're doing here and uh, just pro wrestling in general. It's a, it's a fun time to be in the wrestling business and you're active. You mentioned that uh, last week. Yeah. Before we get to Rob, let's talk oh, about. Oh, I'm super active. I'm super yeah. active. I'm doing the show uh, this Friday in Cleveland for AIW. John Thorne has a hell of a company up there. And they draw, you know, 500 to 1,000 people. With I've been going in now there for four years and managing people like Matthew Justice and uh, and just all kind of cool people. Oh, man, yeah. And that's the thing, too, is we just saw you on MLW this, uh, I think it was on their pay-per-view. You got uh, beat up by Mads Kruger. <laughs> we saw you got knocked out. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I did. I, I just signed up for a verbal contract with them. I'm doing three shows with them, two in Florida and one in Atlanta coming up. That's fair. Oh, yeah. Battle Ride. That's going to be a great show down yeah. there. Yeah. For some mm -hmm. reason, we clicked. They like my style. And, uh, you know, I blend right in, Daddy. Yep. And you and Matthew Justice, you guys you guys are quite the tandem right there, too. Oh, right? he's hardcore, man. He's badass. <laughs> Speaking of which, hardcore is Rob Van Dam. Uh when do you first recall meeting Rob, and what was your first impression, Fonzie? I thought it was very respectful. I met him in uh, 
mid nineties, he came into ECW. Paul Heyman brought me in to do a four week tour. Um, but my gimmick caught on and I ended up going with Taz and managing Taz. And then uh, the first pay-per-view, uh, we left Taz and I went with RBD and Sabu, which was very cool. So that's the first time we kind of started working together. Uh, very respectful and badass. I love RBD. Yeah, Rob had a great feud with Sabu back in 1996. Uh, he faced Sabu at a matter of respect on May 11th. And it ultimately did not shake Sabu's hand, and despite the stipulations of the match. And after he lost, and is that's when he was paired with you guys? What were you told about the pairing, and what was Rob and was Rob on board with like getting with you guys from the get go and stuff like that, pairing up with you? And stuff? We we didn't know what to think. I mean, Paul Heyman had this brilliant idea, and you know, it turned out to be freaking great because <clears throat> when you say mentioned ecw you mentioned that just a, uh, a few names pop up and rbd is the first one i think he was the biggest star of them all sabu sandman uh taz shane douglas uh, there's so many guys but man rbd is a special guy he's got special talent and so he, he could work with anybody the matches that he had with jerry lynn were just freaking incredible um he, Bam Bam Bigelow and RBD, incredible. Spike Dudley, Van Damme can work with anybody. He had that, uh, that special extra strength. And, you know, Van Damme's like a badass, like a, really a tough guy. Uh, man, those thighs, he could he could do shit that uh, nobody else could do. Very unusual. Had special powers, Van Damme. And it was just a great pair, man. It was so cool. And said, Van Damme was so respectful and so and, and brought me right in with him. We just clicked, man. We just clicked. Well, too, before I forget, too, uh, you mentioned it. Uh, your, your first match that you refereed was Terry Funk and the Sheik, and uh, kind of like that full circle moment happening with you and Sabu and RVD. Um, what were your impressions of the Sheik, too, when you got to first beat him and interact with him? And uh, he, he just left such a legacy, too, obviously, on the business. Well, I'm trying to break into business. I'm in my early 20s, if, uh, if I was even 20 in 1978. I went out to Texas with one of my best friends, uh, the Cuban assassin. And he said, Hey, this is my little brother. He's a referee. And, um, and then back then it was four territories. It was Dallas or Von Eriks, uh, Joe Blanchard, Red San, San Antonio and Corpus Christi and all that. Uh, Telly Blanchard's dad, uh, Paul Boss only ran Houston and the Funks ran Amarillo in Northern Texas, Lubbock and all that. Uh, and I got to work for him. One of my first matches I refereed was uh, the Sheik and Terry Funk in a chain match. Now, uh, this was, I think, in 70, late 78 or early 79. And uh, these are my childhood guys I watched growing up. You know, Tampa was a hotbed. I was born and raised in Tampa, and I used to go to the matches since I was 13 or 14 years old. And I used to watch these guys and then be in the ring with them. And then uh, the finish of the Sheik and Terry Funk, uh, the Sheik pulled out a pencil and started stabbing Funk and he ended up stabbing the referee, which was me. And I still got the lead mark in my arm. I think I've mentioned that before, uh, right there. Oh, man. The Sheik stabbed me. So when I told Sabu that story, we instantly bond. And so did Van, Van Damme. He, instantly, he loved the story, you know, because they're affiliated with the Sheik. That's uh, Sabu's uncle and... We trained Van Damme and Sabu, so uh, we just click right away. Man, yeah, what a what a tie in too. It's just so cool. I think that's one of, such a neat story in the world of pro wrestling. You see some full circle moments happen, but like that's such a unique one because you're you are synonymous with Sabu and RVD, and here your very first match was with the guy who trained him. So that's pretty awesome. That's why I'm uh, Dominic. That's why I'm working every weekend, almost every weekend. I'm working somewhere in the country for these different companies and doing uh, podcasts and doing shows and meet and greets and wrestle cons and conventions and wrestling shows. It's because of ECW and Van Damme being in the main event, you know, with Sabu and Van Damme and, and Taz, too, for a while at the beginning. Taz didn't need me anymore because he could do promos and Sabu didn't do promos. So we made a perfect blend. And then when they put me and Sabu together, uh, Van Damme said, Hey, I'm the whole and you too, Sabu. <laughs> it was it was incredible, man. I yeah. don't know what happened, but it did. And I'm still working today because of these guys. Thanks, RVD. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Um, 
So, yeah, Sabu and RVD, they'd eventually have a stretcher match at the Doctor's Inn in later than that same year. And uh, AEW president Tony Khan has said that he was at that show. And I think I saw him. I got a screenshot of him as a kid, I think, with his dad, Shad, in the crowd. Where, uh, where was that? When was that match? This was um, it, later this year, in 1996, later in the year against Sabu at the ECW Arena in Philadelphia. And was I with Sabu and Taz at that time? Uh I think you were with uh, Sabu and RVD at the time. Was it because th- the, they had the stretcher match? Um, okay. And, okay. Yeah. Because, but before that, they had the matter of respect match where like uh, RVD didn't shake Sabu's hand and all that stuff happened then beforehand. So. Yeah. I remember that in Sabu and RVD said, and I respect you, uh, Bill Alfonso. It was pretty good. <laughs> I respect you. So that was pretty cool. Right, right. So, um, but yeah, since Tony Khan, you've have you ever had interactions with Tony Khan? No, no. no. Uh, I met. I uh, was at uh, doing shows for CCW. It's a uh, company out of South Florida that run peer regularly in Florida. They run four or five dates a month in Florida. And damn, uh, damn, I forgot what the question was. Tony Khan. Oh, no, so, so I was doing a show for CCW and QT Marshall was on the show and he came up to me and said, hey, Fonzie, I'm uh, QT Marshall. I'm kind of an agent, work with Tony Khan. He said, your name came up in a production meeting. And I said, well, what do I do? Do I call Tony? Would You know, he said, no, no, just hold on, just hold on. I said, okay. So nothing happened. And a month later, I seen QT Marshall again. He said, Fonzie, your name came up again in the production meeting, uh, AEW. I said, wow, that's great. So uh, what should I do? He said, just hold tight and see what happens. So I'm holding tight. There you go. Holding tight. I'm yes, Ted Tony. Ted Tony, and congratulations to him for doing something that only Ted Turner uh, was able to do besides Vince McMahon. You know, Vince is the king or WWE, but uh, WCW, man, had a great run, and now Tony Khan's doing it. Congratulations. Right, right. 100% and like would love you know, to work for you Tony. And it's neat to see too that um that they uh there is like a a good second tier uh wrestling federation that that's there up there and making prominence and being on network television it's such a big thing I think for the business and gives a lot more options for talent gives a lot more options. Yes. And it's just uh it's always positive to see that. Happen. It's great. They're doing well. They're doing pay-per-views and they're doing events all over the country. They're working every week somewhere. Really cool, man. And they're doing well. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, it is. It's great to see. And uh, shout out to a couple of the fans in here. Fonzie right down the middle says Bob Miller. Thank you. Hey, uh, Bob Miller, daddy. Yeah. Thanks a lot, brother. <laughs> and then we have Alex here and saying Fonzie, extremely underrated. He was perfect for ECW. So how about Thank that? Thank you. <laughs> and we got a couple of questions too. We'll be sure to get to those here. I'm starring them. So we'll be sure to answer those here before we, we end the show here. Um, so yeah, what did you ultimately think when Van Dam and Sabu became tag team partners? Was that always the plan or what were your initial thoughts on that? I'm not sure what the plan was. I mean, I was there. I was supposed to come in. That Dominic, I was supposed to come in. Paul Heyman brought me in, called me and said, Fonzie, we want you to do this angle. I just have WWF and we want to bring you in because Vince McMahon wanted the doctor, his wife, and the two kids at ringside. ECW was uh, 75% male from 19 to 29, hardcore. So just leaving WWF, uh, Paul Heyman thought it would be a good idea for me to come in and be anti-ECW and try to, you know, bring it to family entertainment, which the fans hated me to uh, for it. You know, I got big heat. That's what... Instead of four weeks to get choked slammed by 911, Paul Heyman said, Wow, Fonzie, your character is getting over, so we're going to put you in Taz. And, and that was my first time managing. So I was there from May of 95 until the company, uh, we did 22, 23 pay per views, and I was on 22 of them. I don't think I did the last one. Wow. Wow. How about that? That's pretty wild. <laughs> so when they, I think, uh, um, Paul Heyman had this idea about putting Van Damme together because uh, they were good friends already and me being right in the middle and Van Damme being so arrogant. Hey, I'm the whole episode and you too, Sabu. That just worked, man. That just worked. It just freaking worked. So we took advantage of what, what was working and went with it, you know? 
it was such a cool dynamic too. I was re- I remember telling Rob, I think we first watched a match with him, him and Sabu going up against Candido and Lance Storm. Oh, I think I told this last week was that, and you guys are all backstage and that dynamic between him and Sabu, but you involved in it too. It was like a really great match made in heaven where you have like, it's almost like a kind of a heel dynamic, but it's also like likable dynamic. It's kind of like in that balance of like, Hey, we get mm-hmm. It's friendship, but it's also like this tension is there too, and there's a guy blowing a whistle in the middle of it all too. It's just great. And, stuff. Then, and then the fans start liking it, and the magazines start liking it. We are on the, I'm on so many magazines with RVD and ECW. We got so much coverage. In fact, in 1997, you know there was WCW, WWF, and ECW, and we were competing with them in a small way. And for them, and for the wrestling magazines to uh, give me, you know, competing with Jimmy Hart and all these other managers, uh, manager of the year award. That was pretty freaking cool. Uh, so ECW was doing great. Um, the weekend is so I'm saying it was we were getting so much coverage being uh, a team and well liked, and that the whole Epic show and Van Damme really got over and Sabu, suicidal, homicidal, genocidal Sabu was doing unbelievable stuff, you know, really hardcore stuff, and people had never seen anything like it. And then Van Damme, with those damn thighs he had, he could jump for a half a mile almost, you know. It was <laughs> yeah. unbelievable. And then we used to do the chair spots. My God, incredible matches with Jerry. And thanks, Jerry, for incredible matches with RVD and involving me. And then we used to do this chair spot, call it the hot potato. I throw it to Van Damme, and, you know, back and forth with the chair. And then... Uh, uh, somebody get bandaminated. It was pretty freaking cool, man. <laughs> pretty damn badass. <laughs> yeah, our just boy, neat. people fucking loved it. Am I right? allowed to discuss a little bit? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Okay. And All you know right. what? Too, I think. Um, didn't you guys do that too at the ECW arena with uh, uh, Speedball Mike Bailey? Didn't you guys do a chair spot together? I think during that match. At- We've done so. We. Um, perfected the chair spots we used it in almost every match that we did especially with new people and stuff we would you know call the chair spot and yeah. come up with something and once in a while it backfire and i got the chair <laughs> right but you know that was all that was all entertainment man it was great it was great i didn't mind back then i was young and hell i'm still healthy and relatively young but man i was taking bumps to get my ass beat back then and somehow <laughs> i managed uh come out of it okay with no i don't need a hip replacement or elbows or knees but you know i got a few uh broken bones and stuff oh yeah i broke my damn wrists uh i mean i broke this the smaller bone in my arm so bad we me sandman uh sandman moved out florida he was living in florida and we decided for some odd reason to drive to louisiana and i broke my arm so bad that they had to put a titanium plate and you know eight screws in it was pretty cool uh we just kept working man we would suffer injuries unless it was something really drastic uh we would come to work the next week especially sabu right yeah and like sabu you see some of the spots that he would do and to some of that stuff was like holy crap for that time period how athletic and amazing he was in the ring and for him to like put his body on the line like that it's it's pretty wild to see and uh you know but it's it's such a unique time period where like people that was kind of what the wrestling business was looking for at that moment in time too, you know? That's why ECW got over because we were different. We were hardcore. We weren't family entertainment. Like I said earlier, our clientele was, you know, uh, largely males from 19 to 30 years old, hardcore, man. And um, so we were definitely not family entertainment. And who knew there was a market for that? Paul Heyman knew. And then we all found out and we uh, perfected it, man. And, we were successful. Right, right. That's it. That's the and movie. we still have a cult-like following. Right, Today, still. You know, that's why I'm doing all these wrestling guys. We just went to uh, WrestleMania in Philadelphia. What a place at ECW Arena. Me, I was uh, did two shows, one with Van Damme. I guess both of them with Van Damme. Uh, at the ECW Arena, and we did the WrestleCon three days, and the uh, Van Damme, it was just crazy, man, the people that come up to us. It was a wild weekend, and it that, it was so neat to be there for that show. I was there for your match with uh, 
RVD's match with Mike Bailey, Speedball Mike Bailey, where you managed to yeah, badass. Three. It was so badass. Such a cool, cool right. moment, such a unique moment there. And like, uh, yeah, really special thing to to have it in Philadelphia, and you know, with all the ECW guys and stuff. So it certainly um, was. Absolutely. Um, so uh, eventually, Sabu and RVD they would go on to feud with the Eliminators over the tag team titles. What were your oh, thoughts? Very, on, yeah. Yeah. What were your thoughts on the team of Kronos and Saturn? Are you surprised they never got a look outside of ECW when they were as a tag? They, got, they had a little bit of a look here and there, but I don't know what happened. I don't know why they didn't get a big contract or, uh, um, but they were great to work with, man. Both of them. I just saw Perry Saturn and, um, I guess it was Philadelphia. Yeah. Russell, yeah. He Russell, was right uh, there. I was working for this company. Woo. The, uh, online uh, video game company that I'm on, which is pretty cool. I got a shirt for you too, Dominic, from the Wu company. Oh, uh, nice. Yeah. Oh, speaking of merchandise, yeah. have you come up with something to have some type of contest so I can give away one of these cool RBD, uh, RBD Sabu Fonzi Hardcore Legends Tour jackets? We're going to be giving one away uh, in the short future. I don't know when Sue's dumb and it comes up with uh, some type of uh, raffle, contest, whatever. We're going to give one away. We may give two away, but that's yeah. coming up. They look amazing. Stuff. Yeah, we're definitely yeah. going to have to do something in regards to that. And uh, Yeah, we got another thing to give away. Some Fonzie stuff, you know. Heck yeah, look at that. Cool. That's badass. No doubt about it. So, um, yeah, they were quite the, – the Eliminators, though, they were quite the tag team. Like, just oh, they were badass, work. man. They yeah. Were, tough guys and they could they could go man and um and then for them to have get in there and uh, with van dam and the, van dam was a little stiff but so was everybody uh not that stiff but he you know he was snug but they were snug too man they they had sensational matches right i, I right. like the eliminators they were badass i'm sorry that the one kid passed but uh you know we lose a lot of like our friends but you know, How's Perry Saturn doing? I, I didn't get to interact with him at all during that. I think his body's kind of burned out. Uh -huh. um, he's suffering some uh, uh, old injuries. He's having trouble with his hips and stuff, I, I think. Uh, but he was pleasant to be around. I love seeing him, man. He put on a couple pounds. He looks great, man. Yeah, he looks good from what yeah. I saw. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I worked with him for three days with the uh, Woo Company. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wrestling online. uh yeah, that Ultra Pro Wrestling game that's coming out. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. It's very exciting to hear. Yeah, I'm yeah. excited for that game. I'm on it, Daddy. Come play. Yeah, heck yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited for that. Very excited. Um, Let's see. At ECW Barely Legal, RVD takes on Lance Storm. And after that match, cuts a promo directed at Paul Heyman for not being booked initially on the show. Were you surprised there wasn't a spot for Van Dam on the show? Tommy Dreamer often work on the card. Is that just the way the cookie crumbles sometimes, or uh, how did, did you remember that moment when he wasn't? Uh, Not okay. exactly, but stuff like that did happen, and I don't know if uh, it was uh, on purpose. If he wasn't on the show on purpose, and he fit him in somehow. But look what it look what uh, what ended up happening. RBD was the biggest star in ECW, you know. Yeah, <laughs> it did. No doubt about it. it ended up panning out okay. Okay. Um, yeah, but this would eventually lead to RVD uh, appearing in WWE for a short period of time with Jerry Lawler also crossing over to ECW and ECW guys doing some appearances in the USWA in Memphis. What was your relationship like with Jerry Lawler? It was good because you remember I started off where I had my full-time gig in Florida Championship Wrestling with Dusty and Gordon Soley. And Florida was a hotbed for professional wrestling, man. And I got to meet Everybody in the business came through eventually to Florida from uh, Carlos Colon from Puerto Rico to uh, Mil Mascaris to Bobo Brazil and Jack and Jerry Briscoe. And uh, everybody came through, including Jerry Lawler, pulled down the strap, had that great punch. So I had a working relationship with all these guys that I've uh, for years. So we just clicked in, uh, in ECW. It was a natural fit, man. Jerry Lawler loved us. Yeah, it, it's kind of neat because you look about that time period. Jerry Lawler was so like tied to WWE and being in there and being in that environment and being a heel, and him being paired with RVD in WWE was such a 
such a uh, weird, but it kind of worked in a fu- funky way of a dynamic for the for that time period, like especially with right. The, and yeah. everybody came through ECW, including uh, Cold Stone and Steve Austin. And every, yeah, everybody came through ECW. Rick, uh, everybody, man, it was crazy. How they much? Were- they wanted to come in to make an appearance because we were the hottest ticket in town. We were so different from the family entertainment, man. They loved us. The boys loved us. <laughs> How much heat did Jerry Lawler get in ECW? Like, <laughs> from, from the fans well, and everything like that? Well, he was a character, already established a character for years, so they they loved Jerry Lawler when he came in. He played his part perfect, and uh, and the fans did their part. They booed and cheered them. And, you know, after a while, you know, I, I was kind of a heel when I came in there, but we became, uh, I don't know if you want to call Van Damme a bad guy or a good guy, but we became characters, man. I was beloved towards the end, and I wasn't a bad guy or a good guy. I was just kind of uh, my character and kind of beloved by the fans, man. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. How was how did the ECW locker room handle a, a star like Jerry Lawler being there and stuff like that? Pretty cool. After the initial uh, say hello to everybody and everybody, you know, he was just another one of the boys. Jerry Lawler is no different from me and you. He just, you know, had a big run in Memphis, you know, and then he had his time and, you know, he's one of the agents and, and bosses in uh, WWE or WWF back then when I worked with those guys in 93, the WrestleMania 9, Caesar's Palace. Pretty cool. Yeah, pretty day. We'll have to cover that on the next on another episode here too. Oh week. yeah, we can talk about WrestleManias. Uh, I got all kind of cool stuff to talk about. Giant Gonzalez uh, coming up. I'm actually uh, BBC uh, Sports Radio contacted me today. In fact, yeah, you were saying that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they're yep. gonna get hold of me tomorrow. They're gonna want to set up an interview and talk about uh, me being with the largest athlete on the planet for three years. And from WCW to WWF, it was pretty cool. So I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, no, that'll be that'll be very cool. Yeah, we'll have to keep our eyes peeled for that one for sure. Um, eventually, Rob comes back to ECW full time on June 13th, 1997, and you turn on Taz to uh, realign with RVD and Sabu. It was that, that's the first first pay per view. Yep, the very first pay per view. Did you feel that Taz no longer needed a manager? How did Taz initially get along with RVD and Sabu? I know there's that infamous uh, pick a hand stuff and everything like that, but well, there's that. But uh, I, I, everybody kind of got along in there. We all wanted to do well, and everybody sure. was fighting for the top spot. And then Taz uh, did his job, and he was great. He got over big time. But uh, uh, we all worked together. There was no big problems, you know. Just normal problems that you would have in any dressing room or any time you'd have a, a a locker room or a bunch of people that are work together over and over week after week month after month year after year there's gonna be a little friction here and there somewhere but um uh, but in it, actually we all got along pretty fucking good yeah it seemed like it's such a like obviously it's competitive because it's pro wrestling and it's a locker room very competitive That's yeah a good word. yeah it's competitive but Oh, you almost have that team synergy because it, you guys are the underdog at this juncture. And like, you're the underground kind of uh, fan favorite uh, that is really catching fire. So there's that teamwork camaraderie in that aspect, I think going into play when it comes to that. Um, Absolutely. Did you think, so at this point too, when uh, you turned on Taz at barely legal and everything, yeah, Taz I, didn't need me anymore because yeah. he, Taz had four or five gimmicks before he came Taz. He was like, uh, Tasmania, no, no, no. Uh, he had four or five different names. He was Monkey Boy, he was this, he was that. Then we, when he became Taz, Taz uh, got over because he became himself, you right. know. Like, I'm I can't be anybody else but Fonzie, you know, I can't be anybody else but me. Uh, uh, so Taz had these different gimmicks and they just never got over when he became Taz and himself. And uh, he really got over and worked hard doing it too. And he didn't need, and he didn't need me anymore. And Paul Heyman, I was lucky to, uh, Paul Heyman put me with Taz for the first several months of uh, my career there in ECW. And we were doing promos together and stuff. And Taz could do promos fantastic by himself. And uh, so he actually didn't need me anymore. Did he um did 
did he kind of grow into getting better at promos or was he already a naturally good pro? No, I think he grew. I think he grew. It? Like we all did. I yeah. know a great promo. As a referee for 25 years before I came to ECW, how many times does a referee do promos? Seldom, several times a year. We might do something. But I never did a promo like, hey, daddy, Tuesday night at the Four Homer Hesterly Army, me and RBD are going to kick your ass, Jerry. <laughs> you know, stuff like that. I didn't have all that in me. But all you got to do is tell the truth. I was having troubles doing promos at first. And Tommy Dreamer and, and – uh, and uh, Paul Heyman said, hey, Fonzie, just treat it like a shoot. You know, you're going to be at the uh, ECW Arena August 11th. You know, you're in the chain match. You know this, you know that. So I said, huh. All I going to do is tell him too. Hey, Daddy, August 11th, me and the whole effing show, we're going to kick your ass, you know. And this man. So I became pretty good at doing promos after a while. And then with my two guys, it was made it easier, especially with RBD being spectacular and him being so over. Uh, and Sabu didn't really talk that much at all, but he didn't need to. No, he didn't need to at all. Like that was kind of the neat dynamic about him. It left an air of mystery about. Yeah. Him. Yes, it mm -hmm. certainly did leave a mystery about him. Yep. Yep. Um. Let's see. So at ECW, as good as it gets, you team with Rob against Beulah McGillicuddy and Tommy Dreamer. Oh shit! Yeah. <laughs> this so... match could be its own episode. But did you know right that Yeah, no, we're like, gonna make this match an episode, but I'm yeah. gonna show you in a few seconds. Go ahead. How, how'd you feel about like yeah, did you know that night it was going to be something special, like when you guys No, I had no idea. I had no no clue at all. So it was gonna be a tag match and then uh Tommy Dreamer got hurt before the match and so did Van Dam. So it ended up Vila and and uh uh Joey Styles says uh um, Tommy Dreamer left ringside. He's back. He got injured. RVD left too. Beulah and Fonzie. And then we started <laughs> fast and we fucking did fantastic. I don't know how we did it, but we did. If you ask Paul, if you ask Paul Heyman to name a couple of his favorite matches in ECW, he's going to say Fonzie Beulah, one of them, I guarantee it. Um, it might be one of his favorite matches of all time. He he's, talks about it, puts it over big time. So they say it saved my job, but you know. Well, hey, um, how nervous were you going into that? I think it was just another night and something that uh, it was unusual for me to have a match to begin sure. with. You know, I'm not a wrestler, no, but it was more like a, a street fight, you know, and they, uh, we got together and talked a little bit before, and everybody put their two cents in and. Tommy Dreamer helped us out, and we developed uh, that match, and um, it ended up doing really well. It ended up doing really well, and uh, I almost bled out. Holy uh, smokes, yeah. I had to get rushed to the hospital because I lost so much blood. Uh, it was pretty cool, man. It was pretty cool, and if it wasn't for that blood, I'm glad I almost bled to death because... If I did, we wouldn't be talking about it today. We would just be another boy versus girl, you know, six minute match or whatever it was. Wasn't too long at all, but we did some cool stuff. Yep. Yep. I didn't know I could do stuff like that. <laughs> How about that, huh? <laughs> you know, but I had yeah. been around it for all these years, man. I've been around it for like 27 years, 28 years before I got in the ring with Beulah. So it was kind of a natural fit for me. Because I've seen it done a million times, but doing it yourself is a, a little bit different from being in the referee and watching it, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's good stuff. It was like such a unique time period. And I, I think that really ties in the identity of ECW, too. We um, got some fresh out of that. And uh, it was really cool. Thanks, I, Bueller. Yeah, how about that, huh? Yeah. Um, it has been said that this is a match that was finally shown to Vince McMahon when he first saw the original ECW content. How did you feel about that? And were you ever contacted at the time by WWE? Did you hear about that at all? That it was a possibility that Vince McMahon watched this match and uh, were they watched the Beulah Fonzie match? Yeah, watched the Beulah Fonzie match. Um, he probably he might have. You know, who was a really big fan of ECW it was uh, Shane McMahon. Yeah. Jane was a big fan of ECW. That's why uh, uh, we got a lot of attention. I think it was because of Shane. And then 
Vince had to show some respect and had to show some attention because we were doing so well and developing. Hey, when I walked in the ECW May 1995, I walk in the dressing room now. I just came from WWF a couple of months before uh, I came to ECW for him and called me and said, hey, Bon Jovi wants you to do this stuff. I walk in there. I just coming from uh, a five year run with WCW and WWF making six figures. So. I wore a beautiful suit. I got a Hollenberg briefcase. I'm wearing a Samaritan. I walk in the dressing room, and there's Taz. There's Tommy Dreamer. There's Sandman. I did uh, Little Guido, Mikey. Where I didn't know fucking one guy in the dressing room, and I know everybody in the business. And who the fuck are these guys? But uh, Paul Heyman was developing his own stars, and he did a freaking great job. Right. You know? And then we'd bring in guys, you know, occasionally for, you know, something special. And, uh, um, but Paul Heyman created, or ECW created their own stars. Yeah. They Our definitely... top stars like Tommy Dreamer, Taz, RVD, uh, Sabu, uh, Sandman, uh, and many more. Spike Dudley, Mikey. Uh, there's a ton more I'm leaving out, but. I know there's a lot. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so many of those names. It's just like, and for that time period too, from like, you know, WWE was obviously the top dog there and you had WCW as a top competitor, but they added so much. That whole roster was just its own unique entity together, but there were their own stars in their own way too. And Paul was so great at, you'll hear this, how great he was about highlighting the, the that talent strength and hiding their weaknesses. If they had certain weaknesses and stuff like that, Paul was able to, to read that really well and implement that their strengths into the product. So it's very cool to see that stuff. He was, and no wonder he's a Hall of Famer. <laughs> yeah, he was tremendous. He was tremendous. Did you see his speech, Hall of Fame speech? Oh my gosh, yeah. I was there for it. I was up in the nosebleeds uh, in the press box. covering. Really? Uh, they showed some footage. I, I've see, seen it now, but uh, they showed some footage of uh, Triple H, who's uh, one of the big guys in you know WWE now. Uh, he was at you know at the first couple rows or whatever with his wife, and he loved it. He could see his expressions when he boy he said suck my dick, whatever the fuck he said. It was yeah. cool. And uh, Triple H loved it. Yeah, it was it was very fun. And to so see. did all the fans. They yeah. loved it. They popped big time. Paul Heyman <laughs> being Paul Heyman, he's brilliant actually. Oh, he's so brilliant. Yeah. So the, both those guys together, it's like, I hear, you know, uh, there was obviously like people had their uh, thoughts about Vince and how he handled booking and stuff like that later on when the, the in WWE, but like Paul taking over, Triple H taking over. And then it's kind of good to see those guys with the knowledge and the respect for the history of the business and uh, still being there and being a prominent factor on the, and, WWE's doing really well right now. It's a lot of fun to watch, I think. So yeah, man, what a big company! Now they are we're us. Uh, they use the word wrestling still, but we are sports entertainment. We're entertainers, you know. And uh, man, uh, the WrestleMania has gotten so big. All the all the big uh, Summer Slams and all the big deals have just gotten tremendous. It's a I don't know if it's a trillion dollar company, it's a billion dollar company for sure, but you know, big, big money, man, big money in the production and, uh, and, uh, the guys that are so marketable now, uh, congratulations to Dusty's kid, Cody. Right. Yeah. What do you think of Cody? I like him. I met him when he was a kid. You know, I know his mom, I just saw oh, his mom at, uh, we have the Legends Lunch. A lot of us live in Florida. A lot of guys live in Tampa Bay. A lot of wrestlers. And we have this Legends Lunch uh, every two months or every month and a half or something. And and Dusty's wife, Michelle, was there. And uh, we talked for a few minutes. And, you know, I remember then when they lived in Tampa, when Dusty was the booker here and I worked for Dusty, I was Dusty's left-hand man. Uh, and... Uh, we talked about all that, and Cody was a little kid, so was Dustin. Dustin was just breaking into business. Yeah, it's it's so neat to see those guys, and uh, you know, uh, flourish, and Dustin's still going too, and he's still doing a great job. And it's like, yeah, and Cody's very marketable. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very marketable. Or else he wouldn't have that spot where he's at if it wasn't marketable. Uh, just because he's Dusty's kid, that's not why he's there. He just- and you look at it too. It's like Cody's like has his own unique look and stuff like that. But you can see so much of Dusty in him in regards to how he promotes himself and how he he can see two steps ahead of where you know he, he has, has that been. old school and he has a new school that what it takes to be you know uh, to get over and be marketable in this in this business today. Like uh, Taz's son Hook. Yeah, Hook. You know, oh my God, he's not a big guy. He's not fucking twenty-two inch pythons like superstar Billy Graham. He says, but he's marketable. Yeah, mm-hmm. love. He's got the look. He's got something. He reminds me of like Mark Spitz body, you know. But yeah, uh, he's very marketable, and the kid can work. And congratulations, man. I like him. I know, and Hook. he's such a young kid too. He's got yeah. plenty, of, plenty of time ahead, and he's he's very talented. Very talented. Got a good presence about him too. So yes, he does. Yeah, real quick, we'll get some comments in here. Uh, Voodoo Vic, who's a regular on uh, Rob's show, he says, "I'm glad I almost bled to death." You said when uh, <laughs> with with you and Beulah there. That's one of your quotes you had. I'm glad I almost bled to death. I'm glad I almost bled to death. Is that what yeah, I said? that was the quote you had back back with you and Beulah when you bled out. Like, <laughs> yeah, because it made it made the match. If I didn't bleed like that, if I didn't hit a freaking uh, artery or whatever, I mean, it was shooting out. I mean, <laughs> after the match, after the match is over, I mean, I she hit me with that ten sheet like twenty seconds into the match, and I got busted open, a big juice, whatever. However, I got the juice. Uh, was pretty heavy and it just kept bleeding and bleeding. It would not stop, and it really made the match, man. And uh, after the match, they couldn't stop the bleeding, so they put a big steel plate on my head and taped it up and rushed me to the hospital because I lost so much blood. And our nurse was taking it off. I said, "Hey, it's, uh, be careful how you take it off." She said, "Oh, I've been a nurse for twenty years. Don't tell me how to do my job." I said, "Okay." So she took it off, and soon she took that steel coat, steel plate off my head. Juice shot all over her white outfit, got all over her neck and shit. She was fucking pissed. But they wanted to uh, keep me in the hospital that night, you know, because I lost so much blood. I had to get uh, all kind of IVs and shit. And, and they said, we recommend you. I said, oh, I got a six o'clock flight back to Tampa tomorrow. And they said, oh, no, we, we, you're staying in the hospital for a day or two. Uh, I said, no, I can't. So they made me sign a release form in case something happens to me. Uh, they're not responsible. So that, so I signed a release form and they were wheeling me out. Uh, the doctor was, said, whatever you do, don't smoke cigarettes, don't smoke pot, don't take any pills, don't drink any alcohol. You need to just drink water and get some rest. And uh, we don't even want you to fly because flying is no good for your cut. I said, okay, so they, they wheeled me out of the emergency room, and there's Sandman waiting for me. He's got a 44-ounce bucka with, full of vodka and cranberry. He puts a joint in my mouth and gives me a Percocet, and, of course, I take all of it, you know. I'm <laughs> just crazy, crazy. I don't know why I'm alive today, but uh, it was just a crazy thing. Oh, so, my gosh. <laughs> Holy smoke. That's I'm wild. Gonna, <laughs> That's wild, Paul. <laughs> Uh, Italian says, I was in Peoria, Illinois at an ECW taping. Fonzie jumped the rail and cheered with me for RVD. We made TV the best time of my life. <laughs> How about that? What's his name? His, his name's Italian. He does, um, he joins on and on my Greg Gagne and uh, Magnum TA podcast. He pops in. Also. Oh, Italian. Thank you so much for saying that, Dan. Thanks for putting me over. I wish I could say I remember that night, but there's been so many nights like that. But uh, thanks for saying that, man. Yeah. And it, means a lot. it means a lot to me. When fans come up to me uh, and say, hey, I met you 27 years ago at this arena, this arena, and they tell me the story. It's pretty cool, man, to get noticed like that and people come up to me. It's not like I'm a celebrity. I, I don't know what I would call myself. I don't want to call myself a celebrity. I'm a, uh, a character that, you know, has been in the business a, a long time, so... I guess I am a movie star, kind of. Yeah, you're a bit of a celebrity, I'd say, Fonzie. Kind of. Okay, I'll yeah. take it. I'll, t- I'll tell you that at least, you know? All right. Thanks, Daddy. You're my welcome. Wife a, my yeah. wife, my tall, beautiful, blonde, Hungarian wife, doesn't think I'm a celebrity, but, you know. <laughs> you got to have the balance. Check to the balances there. 
I say, babe, why'd you marry me? Because I'm rich and famous. She says, well, first of all, you're not rich. You may be known to have some notoriety in the wrestling business, but I know nothing about. But, you know, she changed me right up. Right, right. All right. Well, RVD and Sabu would eventually win the tag titles, making Van Dam a double champion, and you the manager of champions. Did Paul always want you to be the manager of champions, or do you think Van Dam was just too good at the time to put a title on anybody else? I think Van Dam, no, he wasn't too good to put a title on anybody else. Van Dam just handled all those titles very well, and he could put them on Van Dam. So that's why he had it. I got a picture of me holding up, hey, baby, I was just putting you over on the podcast. <laughs> you tall and beautiful, and, and, uh, and I'm a celebrity, but you don't think so. And, you know, <laughs> you marry me because I'm rich and famous. Not at all. Okay. I did, okay. <laughs> you heard away. it. There Go it is. Away. <laughs> no way so well, okay what were we talking about oh so a Van Dam. yep yeah so i got a picture with me holding up all the belts man we had the world belt the tv belt the the fuck the world taz's belt the tag belts man but we could hold them we we managed to hold them and then drop them when it was the appropriate time to drop them but when somebody needed a lift we would give them a belt but van Dam carried the load man he and uh he could have, he, he did it. He did a great job. Oh yeah, he definitely did. It's just, no, it, it very obvious why he's a hall of famer, why he's so legendary and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, Van Damme was unusually good in yeah. the ring. You know, he yeah. wasn't average. He wasn't great. He was fucking unusually fucking spectacular. You know, there's <laughs> right. not too many guys can do what Van Damme. A lot of guys copy his stuff now and they do a pretty good Nobody does a five-star frog splash like Van Damme. Nobody takes a bump like Van Damme. Man, yeah. the matches he had with anybody, not, in, not in only Jerry Lynn and Bam Bam Big Lou, but Van Damme could work with anybody and have spectacular stuff. Right. Spectacular, yeah, look- not good. Spectacular shit. All the, all the different opponents he had and his unique style going up against that, it just, such a great presentation. It's just like, yes. immediately connection with with people and fans. Yeah, and they had all those sayings, Mr. Money Night, Mr. Pay Per View, the whole fucking show, you know, Mr. 420. They all fit him and he handled it well, man. Right. Damn. And it, it made our promos uh, even better when he was like that, you know? Right. It definitely did. Yeah. Um, at this point, you've been on the road with Rob for several years. Do you have any good road stories with Rob? Um, just average stories that we traveled together. You know, we worked only on Friday and Saturday. Sometimes it would be a three day weekend, like Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, but, uh, and pretty much 45, 50 times a year, we had very, uh, little time off because we only work weekends. Uh, and we did travel a lot together. I did travel a lot with Sam and we became really good friends and Todd Gordon's one of my best friends. Uh, but when Van Dam bought the when when our uh, Sabu bought a Winnebago, we were driving and and for some crazy reason we're passing this Winnebago place. This old Winnebago's big motorhome. Sabu says, "I'm gonna pull in there." He pulled in there and fucking bought one. You know, <laughs> it was pretty cool. They gave it to him on a whatever they did. You know, it was fucking beautiful. We traveled on that for a while. It was really cool, man. And uh, they sure did smoke a lot of Pacololo. And they always <laughs> had the good shit, too, you know. And I'm, I'm a smoker. Of course I smoke pot. Uh, I've been in, uh, let's see. Look, I'm a championship pot smoker, Daddy. Oh, dang, look at that. How about that? Holy smokes. <laughs> and this came out of the High Times magazine. This should have been the cover, but there's five people who decide who's going to be on the cover of the High Times magazine. And three voted Ozzy Osbourne, two voted Van Dam. Uh, so, but they gave us a centerfold, like a three or four page spread. I had the magazine. I pulled it out in a minute. Uh, but we got all kind of notoriety from that High Times magazine, Daddy. Pretty that's, fucking cool. That's and fucking that's being uh, ECW, ECW being big stars, man, and yeah. Van Dam being uh, 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 pro marijuana. Yeah, you know, absolutely. We talked about that on the recent episode too. Some of the the law changes that might be happening, stuff. Pretty cool stuff. Where they're voting in in Florida right now, it's medical here, 
but mm -hmm. the, the big the voting coming up with the next presidents and stuff, they're voting in uh, to legalize marijuana, just you know, like it is yeah. everywhere else. Rob and was then, giving me all the details about it. It being like um, can't remember what it's called us something one schedule one, and I think it, it which is like where the heavy drugs, hard drugs are on right now, and they wanted to put it to schedule three where it's a more like a latent kind of sentence on that kind of thing. Right. Right. Yeah. Oh, so I, it's going to pass here when yeah. I have all the access to marijuana I want, you know, and really good. I was just in New Hampshire, uh, no, Vermont this past weekend. I went up there with my wife. We went for a few days. We have some friends up there and Pots Legal there when I walked into the store and bought a gram of this, bought a gram of that. But all height is all fabulous weed, man. I don't think there's any bad weed anymore. Right. <laughs> People know what they're doing at this juncture with it, you know? There's so many names, uh, Hardcore Kush, this and that. I mean, it's great. I love it all, too. Right, right. Man, we're getting some good questions in here, so we'll have to get to those okay. here. Okay. Um, let me ask you this one real quick. Voodoo Vic says, when do you when you guys smoke, do you prefer indica or sativa? Do you, would you have a preference there, Fonzie? Well, in the daytime, I like the one that brings you up. You okay, know, sativa. Gives, then I think that, that yeah, the, it gives you a little action, and then at night, late at night, who doesn't like to smoke a joint to try to relax you and bring you down? Because it's hard to. My wife doesn't understand it uh, because I've been on uh, in the business over forty, like forty four years or something, and you know the bell rings at eight o'clock and it's over by eleven o'clock. Then we go out to the after parties and dinners. And I'm in bed at three o'clock in the morning, so my wife's, you know, she's been a nurse. Uh, so she has a normal, normal uh, hours, not like me. So at 11 o'clock at night, I'm wide awake. You know what I mean? So I, I like the real, the good pot that helps you sleep a little bit. I yeah. like both of them. I like both of them. I like good pot. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I know I'm a novice so, with it, but I, I'm not afraid to dabble in that's for sure. <laughs> yes. Yeah, absolutely. And I wouldn't smoke it in Van Damme. I would smoke a joint on the way to the ring or, you know, or you'd be a big pot smoker. But I didn't. I didn't like doing that. But uh, they would make me take a, a cop hit. I would say, okay, give me one hit. So uh, you guys don't think I'm a cop. So I would take one cop. And they would call it a cop hit. You know, it was kind of cool. They were fucking with me. But uh, but after you know, and I got I got a couple ounces around here somewhere that I always keep good pop with me. Heck yeah! Heck yeah! Well, um, let's see here. At uh, oh yeah, we you touched upon this for a little bit already, Fonzie. But talk about the rival between Van Dam and Jerry Lynn. What did you think of their chemistry as opponents? Man, I look back at those matches, and and they had so many matches, that the, and the, and they were good. That's why they continued. That's why the appointment continued booking this this uh, uh, match of Van Damme and Jerry Lynn because they were spectacular. We did them all over the country. Uh, in fact, all over the world. We go to Toronto and we went to Japan and all kind of stuff. And the matches were so sensational. And Jerry was so good. My goodness. Um, spectacular matches. But Van Damme could have matches with anybody. And, uh, but special matches with Jerry Lynn, man. They just were... Unbelievable. I couldn't believe some of the stuff I was seeing. And then Van Damme was being very inventive with those big thighs he had and, and all that power in his legs and that mind he had. It kind of uh, reminds me of a Bruce Lee, uh, Van Damme, uh, all kind of stuff put together, but in, in his own way. You know, he developed his own style. Uh, and I loved it, man. It just He could work with anybody. But those matches with Jerry Lynn is... I, I can't say, say uh, enough good things about Jerry Lynn. And, and uh, if you pull it up, you can Google Van Damme and Jerry Lynn and a hundred matches that come up and watch them. You see what I'm talking about. But you guys know already the couple hundred people that are watching the show or hopefully more. We built it up. Um, yeah, we got a thousand people tuning in right now, Fonzie. We got a thousand people tuning in? We got over a thousand people tuning Fuck, in. Fuck, right okay. Let me bring this jacket up because, hey – uh, not on this show, but Dominic, my co-host, uh, he's Van Damme's co-host too. He's really badass. He's going to come up with some type of a formula to give one of these jackets away. Uh, some type of, not an auction, but some type of uh, game or... Fan giveaway. 
Yeah, some type of giveaway. We yeah, show it up here, Foggy. Really got some really cool stuff to give away. Look. Look at that. Holy crap. Those are badass, Fonzie. <laughs> yeah. And they say, it says, uh, RVD, Sabu, Fonzie, Hardcore Legends Tour has got the original patches on it. They're all really nice quality jackets. Wow. So we're going to be giving one of those away in the next few uh, podcasts that we do. So you guys that are watching tonight, thank you so much. But when Dominic comes up with some type of game system that we're you guys make sure you enter because I would love to somebody out there. I may give we may give a couple away, you know. Yeah. Uh, Definitely. Yeah, we'll we'll come up with a good I giveaway. At, at the shows I do, I take them, you know, I and I sell a few of them. Uh, but I can't wait for you know somebody's gonna be a lucky winner and be wearing one of my jackets or RBD Sabu Fonji Hardcore Legends Tour, Daddy. Well, guys, yeah. T- Tune to next week by the by next or next episode. So two weeks from now we'll do we do this every two weeks. So be sure to tune in uh, two weeks from now, and uh, we'll we'll announce the giveaway then and, and what you. Do. Yeah, we Dominic's gonna come up with some type of game. So mm-hmm. you guys enter and win. Voodoo Vic wants to know real quick what is your largest size jacket you got there, Fonzie? Any size you want. I have uh, from smalls to XL is a, the most common jacket. People love the XLs, but they come up to, you know, double X. If you're a big kid, we'll make one for you, brother. We'll there make you go. Daddy, no problem. No uh, problem there. Have mediums, uh, large and XL right now. I think I will have one double X. Uh, but they're all cool. Yeah. You know what, Fonzie? I think what I'm going to do, we're going to make this a two-parter with Rob because I have some more questions here. Okay. I want to get to some fan questions before we we close out. Yeah, um, we never haven't even talked about all the all the magazines. I mean, I have literally. I'm looking to my right, right here. In, uh, in, we're in my office, by the way, in uh, yes. Tampa, Florida. I got a beautiful home with my beautiful, tall, blonde Hungarian wife, and I got all kind of memorabilia and all kind of cool pics that we're gonna uh, we can give away. Cool pics. This is when we went to Japan. I got the bonsai. <laughs> uh, I think I'm my uh, number one. And this man, That's man, awesome. Man, Tokyo, and we just got all kinds of stuff. This is one of my favorite pictures right here. Uh, and I usually sign these and sell them at, at uh, conventions and stuff, but I give away a lot, you know. Right. Uh, so oh, we got man. a lot of cool stuff, and we got ECW belts. And uh, Harley Race gave me this belt. Somebody had made it for him. It's a replica of his belt. And somebody made it and gave it, or they bought it and gave it to Harley Race. And Harley said, thank you. And he said, here, Fonzie, this is for you. Because I remember so many of his matches, the Barry Windham and Harley Race and all the Dusty and Harley Race back in the 80s and stuff when Harley was champion. He's a great champion. So we got a lot of uh, memorabilia. Here's a great picture of uh, uh, Sabu, Fonzie, Taz, RBD, and um candido right is that candido? yeah chris candido candido's brother johnny i think his name is johnny he put this on posted this and it got over uh, almost a couple hundred thousand views the likes on this this picture it was taken at the show uh, of Ranch, Punk's retirement in uh, amarillo wherever it was at the double cross ranch and, here, and here's the poster that we were out there sabu with fonzie there's a picture of RBD. Look how young and beautiful RBD was. Can you see him? Yep. Oh, man. Yeah. That was yep. before he was a whole fucking show. Uh, Mr. Pay-Per-View, Mr. 420, he was RBD. So uh, that was a while back. So that picture was taken, man. It was pretty cool, man. Pretty damn cool indeed. Yeah. Yeah. We got so much cool stuff to talk about and give away and, and uh, reminisce and, you know, get the tons of questions from you guys and, uh, so many magazines that we're in. I'm in with Van Dam. Uh, this is my boy Van Dam. Yeah, uh, we just did tons, tons of magazines together. Remember the ECW magazine? Oh and yeah, we had all magazine man. Heck yeah, yeah, look at that. Magazine. Man, catching fire. Very cool. Oh, um, this is, what do you got there? This is the Wow. Magazine, remember that? Oh, I remember that magazine, yeah. Yeah, it was very successful. World wrestling. I guess yeah. it was on the centerfold, uh, yeah. you know, 
in the, in the center, uh, me and Van Damme, of course. Van Damme was just over, well-loved, well-respected by all his peers, too. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody loved RVD because he was so cool uh, was to be cool. around and, you know, and such a great worker. The boys loved right? him. Yeah. Right? Well, uh, let's get to some questions here. Okay. I think I know the answer to this one. Italian says, who smoked more, Sabu, RVD, or Fonzie? I didn't smoke uh, a, nothing compared to these guys. I may smoke. <laughs> not now, I'm retired and at home. I just work at these events on weekends here and there. Uh, I smoke about a joint a day. Van Damme is the biggest pothead I've ever met. Uh, Sabu is a yeah. pretty good smoker, too. But I think RVD uh, holds the record in smoking the best Bacalolo in the most. No doubt. Of was RVD the best worker you've worked with? That's hard to say because Jack Briscoe is the best worker I've ever worked with. Harley Race is the best worker. Dory Funk Jr., Terry Funk, Sabu, Sandman was great. RVD was great. Jerry the King was great. Dr. Death Steve Williams was great. Andre the Giant was great. Everybody, Jake the Snake, I've worked with so many different people. You can't tag one guy. It's almost impossible. But I'll say if RVD was, uh, had something special and he was one of a kind, he was... He would, uh, you know what? He might have been the fucking one of my favorites. <laughs> you know, now that we look at it that way. Yeah. Because I always got to RBD. You know, RBD didn't take me. They, the office put us together, and we just clicked. And uh, um, was in the main events. I wasn't uh, never on the first match. I wasn't, uh, you know, on the first opening card which is the opening match on the wrestling show is very important it sets the pace for the whole show but i wasn't i was always in the top three main events so uh so that was with van damme or sabu and uh yeah so van damme may be my favorite he's he's tough it it's is the manager of champions and i got my boys right there and this is a picture that i sell and give away at the wrestling uh, shows that I do all over the country. Uh, the manager of champions calls it right down the middle. There's my three boys. Well, my two boys, two. Taz is my boy for a while too. And Taz is, I love Taz. Oh, Taz is awesome. He's so yeah, great on commentary too. It's, he's, oh, he's spectacular. My God, he's spectacular. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He really is. Yeah. Uh, J J Jair asks, Fonzie, did you like the WWE version of ECW? RVD should have been champ there. Did you like their version? What did you think about that? Uh, it was watered down to a certain... Uh, I'm looking for a picture. Um, it was watered down. It wasn't the same. You can't... It was never, never going to be the same. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I did like the version, but the original version was uh, the way to go. You yeah. know, looking at this picture is, has, uh, um, it relates to the question. But yeah. I think... Uh, uh, WWF guys, WWE guys, and ECW guys all on center stage at center stage in New York City when we did some uh TVs. Yeah, uh, we were doing joint efforts there. Uh, it was different. WWE's version was not the same, not the same. Yeah, I agree. It they, they, I think it started off pretty well, and then they got off the beaten path of what ECW was about, and it just didn't tie together. Yeah, exactly. That's kind of it. So uh, let me see. Oh, <laughs> this is a good one. OG Wrestling Fan 17, thank you. He says, Fonzie, we need to see you in Juggalo Championship Wrestling, the ICP. Uh, ICP's uh, <laughs> pro wrestling promotion. Oh, I work, I work with one of those guys. So it wasn't Billy Corrigan was with those guys, were they? Yeah, they were in the NWA. They did some NWA stuff. Uh, well, I just did a show with Billy Corrigan for Billy Corrigan, the NWA show. Oh, and nice. Come do some stuff, and I did. And yeah, I would love to work with those guys again. Yeah. Uh, Billy loved me for the. He invited me. He, he has one of his sisters call me and say, Hey, Bonzi, Billy Corrigan wants you to come do something for the NWA. And I did. And, and then we worked out. I seen Billy. It was great to see him. Holy uh, shit. Yeah. So. I'm staying really busy. I'm booked up. I let's see. I brought my booking sheet here to give you a, a kind of an idea what uh, I got doing uh, going. So 
let's see, uh, we're finishing May. This Friday, I'm in, uh, I told you guys, AIW for John Thorne Cleveland. Uh, June 1st, I'm working in West Virginia with Sandman, Francine, Sabu. Um, on the 8th, of, uh, I'm going to Minnesota. Then I'm going on a European tour. I'm going on vacation to uh, um, Switzerland, not for wrestling related, but uh, my wife and I are going to Switzerland, uh, Barcelona, and 10 days in Italy on tour. Then when I get back, I go right to Chicago on the 29th and work there. Then uh, July, I'm booked for the whole month. I'm in uh, at the ECW Arena, uh, July uh, July 6th, um, and it's for Battlegrounds. It's for the, the show that I did with uh, RBD. Yeah, that's a great promotion. Bill Gardner there Friday and Saturday at the East uh, WrestleMania weekend. I'm coming back and doing something with them. I'm working with MLW, uh, of course, AIW again. I'm yep. booked all the way through. Let's see. Damn. Uh, I have Damn, made all the way to in, uh, the end of the year. It's crazy. It's crazy. You can't beat that, Fonzie. And it's because of ECW, not because I was an international five-star referee. You know, <laughs> with it was on the covers of uh, all kinds of magazines all over the world. There's Giant Gonzalez, and it was WCW, and the Japanese office did a joint show, 65,000 people at the Tokyo Dome, and I refereed Fujinami, Ric Flair, and a controversial fitness, and and uh, Giant Gonzalez, we're going to have an episode about him. I told you that BBC called me and we're going to oh, yeah. do a big article, big talk about, you know, me being his handler, a special, special guy. I, so the kind of the perks I would get being the personal assistant for Giant Gonzalez was, you know, doing uh, Baywatch, doing uh, Hulk Hogan's Thunder in Paradise, going on different talk shows. Uh, having Ted Turner call me. I think I mentioned this before. Yeah. And Ted Turner, my phone rings and it's, uh, hey, Fonzie, uh, Ted Turner. I thought it was one of the boys ripping me. And he says, uh, Fonzie, can you do a favor for me? I said, certainly, Mr. Turner. And he said, call me Ted. I said, okay, Ted. He said, I want you to go. You know, I own the Braves. I own the Atlanta Hawks. The Braves have been winning World Series and we're doing spectacular. I want you to take Giant Gonzalez and go sit in my booth with me and Jimmy Carter would usually sit. And the camera's going to pan to uh, Giant Gonzalez, and the company is going to say, hey, the Braves are doing so good. It brings the largest athlete on the planet to watch them, you know? And it doesn't say, and Fonzie, too, but I'm sitting yeah, right there dying, you know? Uh, <laughs> but all kind of perks like that. So uh, so we got a lot to, to talk about with him coming up. Absolutely, and yeah. And one of our so podcasts. Oh, yeah. We got a lot more to hear. That includes our RVD, because we I have some more uh, – more research done by Robert D. Felice here that we're going to cover next week or yeah, next don't episode. Don't me up, Dominic. I can talk all night long, Danny. Don't get I me know. to wrap up. Okay, I'm fucking with you. But, yeah, we got a lot of stuff to cover, man. If, if we get some followers, like you said, we got a 1,000 people watching our show. Yeah, on Twitter questions. and on, on YouTube. So we got a good contingency on RVD's Twitter. And then we're watching on RVD TV. We got folks tuning in on RVD TV. A lot of comments coming in. That's spectacular. There. Thank you, everybody, for yes. tuning in, man. If you got some questions, uh, a lot of you guys know my background and know that I work for Florida Championship Wrestling and WCW and WWF and WrestleMania and, and the ECW. Now I'm doing shows all over the world uh, still and still pretty active and still very busy on weekends. I'm booked all the way to the end of the year. It's fucking right. crazy. But so crazy. hopefully we can uh, bring some entertainment for you guys. You right, know, guys. By, uh, telling some Dusty stories where I sucker punch Dusty or Roddy Piper shooting the alligator, taking his clothes off to go swim across the canal to get the dead alligator. And the alligator comes back to life and chases Piper and, you know, and me and Muda uh, going across Alligator Alley. And I hit an alligator going 100 miles an hour and I hydroplaned over him. And we thought he was dead. And I threw him in the trunk of a Cadillac. The alligator was so big, you know how a, a trunk of a Cadillac's huge, right? Yeah. Uh, this was in the 80s, so the trunks were really big back in the 80s. We had a Cadillac. The gator was so big, we had to fold the, do fold the gator up like a donut. So halfway back to Tampa, the alligator, I just gave him a concussion. He came out to life and started thumping and kicking and doing shit in the back, 
and the drunk man and Muda was freaking out. It was pretty fucking cool. But we <laughs> got a lot of stuff to talk about. Stories. That was you and Great uh, Muda? Oh, yeah. Yeah. He came, well, Hiro Matsuda, Japanese superstar back in the day, mm -hmm. in the 60s and 70s, he was part owner of Florida Championship Wrestling with Eddie Graham on a small percentage. And he would book the American guys in Japan and to bring the Japanese wrestlers uh, to uh, Florida and to the United States. So, and I was right in the middle of it, you know? So I got to see all these Japanese guys. I've been working with Japanese guys my whole career, my whole career. And I've worked with guys that, you know, the old time, when I started full time in 1980, that was a long time ago, like guys like Bobo Brazil was finishing up. They were the tail end of their career. So I got to work with Jack Briscoe, Bobo Brazil, all these legends. My God, it was fucking, so we can talk about everybody. It's just good. We're going to have a good time. And obviously, I'm having a good time. I'm enjoying myself right now. And I'm not even high. I haven't taken a pill, smoked a joint, nothing yet, Daddy. This is me being me. Right? No, it's a great time. We got, yeah, over 1,200 people tuning in right now. So, guys. Oh, thank you, 1,200 people. Thanks, 1200. Daddy. It's really cool of you guys to tune in. To, uh, and I hope we can entertain you. Absolutely. Guys, yeah, be sure. If you have questions, use hashtag Ask Fonzie throughout the week. Get your questions in. We'll, we will be on air uh, in two weeks from now. So I believe that will be at the beginning of June. I th I don't know the date exactly offhand when it comes to June in the calendar. Let me see if I can pull that up real quick just so I know. Yes. So two weeks from now, it'll be June 4th. Be sure to tune in on June 4th. We'll be live again. We'll cover RVD a little bit more. We'll have another topic too to, to touch upon. And we'll go from there. But use hashtag Ask Fonzie. Um, Get the word out. Go to rvdtv.com if you're watching on Twitter. Subscribe, like, share. There's going to be clips up there of Fonzie talking. There's going to be uh, clips of RVD up there. Uh, we got some good content going up there. Um, and by and then, Dominic will have some type of game, some type of event. Yes. You guys to win the, one of these cool ECW jackets that I'm so happy to be given to one of the 1,200 people that's watching today. I wasn't going to give one yeah. right now, but... Uh, We'll wait till Dominique comes up with a plan. They're pretty cool. We got black ones with the hoods on them. All kind of cool shit. Can't beat that. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, guys, All yes, sizes, you know, too. One kid asked about what sizes do we have. Every fucking size, Daddy. There you go. We're, we're going to be ready to roll here. Um, let's see here. Okay. I think that'll do it. Let me see. Oh, wait. Okay. Let's go. Let's close it out with this one here. The Monday Club OTW. He says, was Fonzie the man in the middle for Bruiser Brody versus Lex Luger? Were you? Yes, I that? was, Daddy. Wow. Okay. Uh, that was, let's see, where is that picture? Uh, damn it, when you want the picture, you can't find it. <laughs> you can't find it. <laughs> right, but I got it, Daddy. Oh, here it is right here. So Lex Luger, we trained him. He was a football player, and he wanted to become a professional wrestler, and we trained him right here in Florida. Uh, and about the first year, they were handpicking his opponents. Uh, he was getting over. He was learning the business. And then for some odd reason, they booked him in a steel cage against Bruiser Brody. He was, had been in the business 25 years already, a big star in Japan, very temperamental. And, you know, uh, and they just did not have a good match. And uh, there was a cage match. And uh, there it is right here. Yeah, I was a referee for that match, for that famous match, Daddy. That's crazy. How about that, Fondy? Man. Yeah, we'll touch upon Bruiser. We'll touch upon all those guys coming up. So you guys be on the lookout for that. Be sure to fo follow Fonzi at Alfonso Bill on X or Twitter or whatever you want to call it. Uh, they, what's your username on Instagram, Fonzie? Bill Fonzie Alfonso. Bill Fonzie Alfonso. So follow me on yeah, Instagram, Facebook, on and uh, uh, Twitter, and then uh, the X. Uh, um, it's Alfonso Bill. All right. So that's how you guys do it. But I'm easy to find, Daddy. I'm easy to find. Anybody wants to message me or anybody interested in any of these jacks? But wait, I'm going to be giving a couple away. I said one, but I'll probably end up. If I got 12, 15, to a couple thousand people following our damn podcast and there you guys enjoy it, why wouldn't I give a couple away, you know? Right, yeah. I'm oh, enjoying giving them away as you guys receiving them. There we go. How about that? See, that's great. 
And uh, thanks, shout out to Shrooms and Metal. He says, love you, Fonz and Dom. Thanks for a good time. Thank thanks, you guys Dad. for a good time. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Italian, Voodoo Vic, uh, The Monday Club. Uh, we have uh, and the other guys that just tuned in with uh, questions early on, too. Thank you, guys. Bob Miller uh, and Alex Hearn. So thank you, guys, for all tuning in. Yeah, uh, thanks, everybody. Thanks to the 1,200 people who are watching right now. And I uh, really appreciate it, man. And we're going to try our best to fucking entertain you guys. Yep, 100%. We'll cover more RVD next week or to two weeks from now, June 4th. Be on the lookout. And uh, we'll see you next time here on Right Down the Middle. With Bill, this is Bill Alfonso saying so long for the Sunshine State. How about that? <laughs> See you guys.